Hello everyone, welcome to part three of my three-part series on Dream of the Red Chamber, also known as A Dream of Red Mansions by Cao Shui Qin, or perhaps somebody else. Uh, at the end of part two, I alluded to the controversy regarding the authorship of this final section of the novel. While I don't like to dwell too much on authorship questions or things like this, I thought it might be worthwhile to briefly introduce the subject. During Cao Shui Qin's lifetime, the only version of Dream of the Red Chamber to be publicly circulated was an 80-chapter version that ends abruptly with Ying Chun returning to her abusive husband after an emotional visit home. The story at this point is clearly unfinished. No one has met the fates alluded to in the initial dream, and the Jia family is only approaching the brink of their impending collapse. While there are plenty of unfinished stories in the canon of world literature, either unfinishable or simply cut short by fate, it would be hard to find an example more utterly jarring than this one. For example, we have several novels by Franz Kafka that are cut off mid-sentence during the final chapter, but in these cases it almost makes a certain amount of sense, as if the reader is suddenly awakening from a long and arduous dream. In the case of The Dream of the Red Chamber, we are left desperate for an ending, and thankfully, we have one. Collated and published by Gao E and Cheng Wei Yuan in the decades following Cao Shui Qin's death, the 120 chapter version of the novel fulfills all of the promises laid out in the earlier chapters, ending the novel finally with the return of Chia Yu Tsun and Chen Shi Yin, who were our introduction to the book's world in the first place. However, the question still remains who wrote these chapters? and how. There is much controversy on this point, as Gao and Chang's story of how they came across their manuscript reads almost like a novel in itself. According to their prefaces, they were so enamored by the novel that they searched far and wide for the remaining chapters, eventually happening upon unedited chunks at various book vendors, where they bought them at a high price. After gathering all their materials, the two set to work fashioning them into a complete novel, revising and editing the already existing chapters as they did so. In the intervening centuries, much has been made of the idea that sections or the entirety of this final volume were composed by either Gao or Chang themselves veering to greater or lesser extent from Shui Chen's initial vision. The controversy is immersed in political and historical considerations, as well as being highly interpretive due to our lack of evidence. Due to the complexity of this ongoing academic discussion, combined with the fact that much of it is carried out in a language that I do not read nor understand, it would be unwise for me to venture deeply into these waters. However, I do feel it necessary to offer a few words on the topic. There are sections of Volume 3, particularly near the beginning, where it feels clear to me, even reading a translated version, that they are either the work of a different author or an unpublished rough draft of work by the author of the previous two volumes. The flow of the pacing is different, the characters speak a little differently, and the general style is just not quite the same. However, this doesn't seem to be the case for all of the chapters, and if this is in fact the work of a separate author, it is my completely unfounded belief, or should I say my impression, that they are working from extensive notes or drafts left by Cao Shui Qin himself, if such a man even exists. For a book with as much foreshadowing 
as this one. It might seem like it would be easy for a second or third author to pick up the pieces and construct an ending. But unless done with a careful hand, it would be just as easy for such an ending to be entirely too neat and to throw away much of the novel's complexity. While these final chapters wrap up the story, they do it in the same sort of strange and ethereal way that the rest of the novel has played out. It is not neat. And yet, when we, during the rest of this episode, explore the ways the ending reflects and expresses the recurring themes of the novel, it ends up feeling cohesive and whole. There's no way for me to know exactly who wrote Dream of the Red Chamber. I can't even be sure that Cao Shui Qin wrote the first two volumes. It's all too murky and shrouded in historical mystery for me to make much sense of. All I can say is that the book that I read, translated into English in the 20th century, feels cohesive. It feels like a complete work, and I see no other option than to treat it as a complete work. To speculate on what could have been different would be to speak of an imaginary novel, a novel which none of us can read or gain anything from at all. Dream of the Red Chamber is, at this current moment, the words we have on these pages, and in my eyes, regardless of who wrote what, how, it is a beautiful novel, one of the great works of world literature. We ended part two with our quote from a Taoist priest. Quote, you should know that all good things in this world must end, and to make an end is good, for there is nothing good which does not end. My song is called, All Good Things Must End. When I first read this book, I couldn't help but feel betrayed by this final volume. Like I had been given something beautiful, only to have it so cruelly snatched from my hands. I wanted my time with Bao Yu and Dai Yu, Bao Chai, Shi Fang, and many others who I couldn't even fit into this series of episodes to last forever. I didn't want to see bad things happen to them. I somehow convinced myself that it would all just work out in the end. But Dream of the Red Chamber is a tragedy. This is made clear from the very beginning, and yet it somehow pulls off the trick of telling you explicitly that it's going to be a tragedy, and then making you hope that somehow or in some way it was lying. As things go from bad to worse, you read on. You read on to find out what happens next, even knowing that it's not going to make you happy. To explore all the misfortunes that befall all the members of the Jia family during this volume would be exhausting, and beyond the scope of this examination. I would like, instead, to focus ourselves once again primarily on Bao Yu, whose actions at the end of the novel elucidate much of the novel's integral themes. Dream of the Red Chamber is a huge novel, and there are many different ways one can look at it. As far as I can tell, the primary focus of Redology, which is the term for the study of this book, has been biographical, historical, and political analyses. The edition I have, published in Beijing in 1980, contains not one but two quotes from Mao Zedong, in its preface. I'm not an expert in Chinese history, and most of what I know about Chinese society in the 18th century comes from novels like this one. In part two, I made something approaching an attempt to place the story in its historical and cultural context, but that is really the limit of my abilities in that respect. As non-Chinese readers, 
of Dream of the Red Chamber, divorced from the long history of scholarship regarding the novel, we end up coming at the book from a different perspective, free from many of the biases that may have built up over the centuries. We are free to read the novel as literature. What we will focus on and find noteworthy will likely be quite different from what a Chinese reader might notice, and this we can turn into a strength, in the same way that a Chinese reading of any English or North American novel has the potential to shine a new light on our understanding. Thus, you must forgive me for passing over many notable events from this final volume that would be considered absolutely vital to other examinations. What's important to us is merely the fact that things don't go well. There is little levity in this third volume of Dream of the Red Chamber. What little levity there is is shared between reprehensible men who gamble and drink away their lives. Eventually, these men get their comeuppance, but they're not the only ones. The Ning Mansion is seized by the Emperor for their misdeeds. Jia She is arrested. Jia Zhang is disgraced. Shui Pan gets convicted of murder, and concubine Chao gets dragged straight to hell. The innocence of the Grand View Garden, where Bao Yu and his friends wandered around among pleasant flowers, sipping tea and writing poetry, flying kites and playing games, is also destroyed. The garden empties, and with no one to take care of it, it becomes overgrown and is infested by evil spirits and demons. Eventually, it becomes so bad that Taoist priests are called in to perform an elaborate ritual in an attempt to purify it. But even this is not enough, as soon after, the entire mansion is ransacked by bandits who make their entrance through the gates of the garden. These are but a few of the events that make up this final volume. But we must cast many of these aside, treating them only as the backdrop for the story which we wish to focus on, that is, the story of Baoyu and his search for spiritual understanding. Among all these disastrous and distressing events, the most striking and impactful element of this tragedy is the resolution of the question of whom Bao Yu will marry. Lin Dai Yu, the frail and sickly otherworldly poet with whom Bao Yu shares an intense spiritual connection, or Shui Bao Chai, whose beauty and prudence promises a happy and stable life. This is not a question posed to Bao Yu himself, for his is a world in which the parties being married don't have much of a say in the matter. The question is instead posed to the world, and it is only fitting that the world opts for the most worldly option. This will only come as a surprise to the most deluded of readers, a group which included myself. As a young man who spent years clinging to his own impossible loves, piling them one atop the other until the whole world seemed impossible, I needed Dai Yu and Bao Yu to end up together. I needed my yearnings vindicated, to be shown that, at least within the comfortable realms of fiction, such yearnings may be justified. However, A Dream of Red Mansions is not about the comfortable realm of fiction. It is about the deeply uncomfortable and distressing realm that is our real Earth. Shui Bao Chai is, in her own right, not someone many people would be unhappy to be married to. She is beautiful, she is intelligent, and she is capable. She not only understands literature and poetry, but also how to run a household and how to get along with other people. It is one of the great ironies of the novel that marriage to Bao Chai, who in any other situation would be the ideal partner, is the bad ending.
And it is tragic for her also, because she has to be married to a man who will always see her as the bad ending. Bao Yu has nothing against Bao Chai, but he clearly does not love her, for all he respects her. Beyond having a husband who does not love her, she has to live with the understanding that her marriage was a sham and a trick. First, let's understand how this trick came about. Bao Yu mysteriously loses his jade of spiritual understanding, and this causes him to fall into a stupor, half insane and barely aware of the world around him. Every word he speaks is even more nonsensical than normal, and he often zones out for hours at a time. His family can only conclude that he is deeply ill, and that something must be done to help him. Since it's been said from the beginning that a connection between gold and jade will bring good luck, they conclude that a marriage to Bao Chai, with her golden locket, will help mediate whatever evil influence is working itself on Bao Yu. However, there remains the problem of Dai Yu. Shi Zhen reveals to Lady Wang, Bao Yu's mother, the extent of the love between Bao Yu and Dai Yu, and that it's unlikely he would willingly go along with any other match, even in his adult state. Shi Feng, clever as she is, comes up with a trick. While they arrange the wedding between Bao Yu and Bao Chai, they convince Bao Yu that he is instead of being married to Dai Yu, a prospect which pleases him a great deal. Upon hearing of Bao Yu losing his jade, Dai Yu had wondered if this had perhaps been an omen, showing that she had gotten in the way of the prophesied match between gold and jade. When a careless maid named Numskull accidentally reveals the truth of the impending marriage between Bao Yu and Bao Chai, Dai Yu falls into a daze. She wanders over to Bao Yu's quarters before anyone can stop her, and in a horrifying scene, the two just sit on the bed and stare at each other, smiling and laughing, their minds completely empty, just two hollow shells in each other's company. Dai Yu was always sickly and often ill, tormented as she was by her loneliness and her lack of a home. She was kept afloat by the love and generosity of those around her, and particularly by Bao Yu. Although they didn't know how to express it to each other, they both understood each other's love, and Dai Yu was propped up by Bao Yu's constant generosity. Knowing that this relationship they had had is now gone forever, that Bao Yu will never be there for her as he was in the past, kills Dai Yu. She dies at the precise moment of Bao Yu's wedding, his name being the last words to escape her lips. In her final hours, she understands that she's been betrayed, and she departs from this world not exactly alone, not wholly alone, but without that most important presence that kept her alive for all these years. We already knew their love was impossible. We knew it from the very beginning. But to see its impossibility emphasized so dramatically, shoved so emphatically in our face, is almost too much. It certainly is too much for Bao Yu, who once he recovers his jade and returns to his senses, goes searching for Dai Yu in another world. I will return to that specific scene later, but for now I'd like to discuss Bao Yu's broader reaction. But to do so properly, we need to first talk about Shi Chen. Shi Chen is Bao Yu's cousin from the Ning household, Jia Zhen's sister. Although she is from the other household, she grows up in the garden alongside Bao Yu, Dai Yu, Bao Chai, and all the others. She is a gifted painter, and is tasked with painting a portrait of the gardens, which she never ends up finishing. Most importantly, Shi Chen is principled and strong-willed. 
She insists on following her ideals and will not allow anyone to talk her out of anything. When she finds the Ning household to be morally bankrupt, she cuts herself off from them completely in order to remain pure. This is just the first step in her search for purity. Shi Chen is good friends with a girl named Miao Yu, who is a Buddhist nun living in the monastery on the mansion's grounds. And this is likely the source of her belief in the corruption of the world. Over time, Shi Chen becomes more and more radical in her denouncement of the worldly world. From renouncing her family specifically, she moves on to renouncing the entirety of worldly life. When she announces her intention to shave her head and join the monastery, she is admonished for her recklessness. Not only is it a ridiculous sort of thing to throw a life of luxury away like this, it's also a bad look for the family's reputation for a girl of high society to lower herself in this way. Most nuns, it seems, are girls of lower class or girls with nowhere else to go. Shi Chen's family does not recognize the depth of her convictions, brought on by the calamities she's experienced recently, particularly the sacking of the mansion by burglars, during which Miao Yu is kidnapped by bandits. This event seems to be the final nail in the coffin for Shi Chen's connection to our world. When Shi Chen is announcing her intention to renounce the world and become a nun to her family, Bao Yu is around, and he utters mysteriously, How sublime! and recites a poem. She sees through the transience of spring, dark Buddhist robes replace her garments fine. Pity this child of a wealthy house, who now sleeps alone by the dimly lit old shrine. This poem is taken directly from the register of the twelve beauties that Bao Yu read during his first dream, all the way back in chapter 5. Back then, he was unable to connect what he was reading to anything in the real world. It was all just nonsense, and thus slipped from his memory. But now, he looks at Shi Chen, and immediately understands her fate. This is because, ever since Dai Yu's death, Bao Yu has been on his own path toward renunciation. Bao Yu has always seemed to be somewhat distant from the goings-ons down here, treating much of life as if it were a game or a distraction from more important things. He recognized that striving in business or politics was mere vanity, but he couldn't tie this indifference into any broader philosophical framework. Instead, he simply chased after otherworldly things, namely girls, poetry, and literature. Let me just say that I can relate. The first dream that Bao Yu dreams is a warning. The goddess of disenchantment explicitly says that she was asked by Bao Yu's ancestors to steer him away from his amorous pursuits. Bao Yu has clearly recognized in some way the divine qualities of the girls around him. They are, after all, spirits descended from heaven. But unaware of their true nature, he instead has become attached to their earthly presences in the form of lust and passion. This is not necessarily sexual lust. The goddess calls it a lust of the mind, but it is equally misplaced. However, advice is nothing without experience. No one really believes advice or warnings, whether coming from goddesses or from their parents, until it is corroborated by their own experiences. Thus, Bao Yu is unable or unwilling to follow what the goddess says until her premonitions start to come true. One by one, the girls are swept away by their fates, and although it's not explicitly stated, we can say that with each one, Bao Yu is becoming closer and closer to true understanding. The death of Dai Yu 
the loss of Bao Yu's strongest attachment is the shock that precipitates the final leg of Bao Yu's journey. As the affairs of his family fall apart around him, Bao Yu is paid a visit by another Bao Yu. Much earlier, it was hinted that there exists in another city another young boy named Bao Yu from a different family who looks like an exact double of our Bao Yu and even behaves in much the same impetuous manner. For simplicity's sake, I'll just refer to this character as Bao Yu's double. This double makes an appearance at the Jia Mansion on a visit to the capital. He has also heard of our Bao Yu and their supposed similarities, and wants to make his acquaintance. This excites Bao Yu, who has always been enthusiastic to meet his double, even going so far as to dream about him. However, at their meeting, they don't see as eye to eye as they expected. As it turns out, Bao Yu's double has lived a much different life than Bao Yu. While they shared the same irreverence and enjoyment of female company as youths, they have matured in quite different ways. Bao Yu's double has put away his youthful folly and turned toward a responsible life, focusing on his studies in order to get a government position. He is keen to participate actively in civil life, and greatly reveres those civil servants who bring honor to their family. Bao Yu, of course, is sickened by such vulgar talk. In his eyes, his double has simply acquiesced to the pressures of his father and wider society, parroting the Confucian principles of order and honor that Bao Yu continues to actively reject. Instead of coming to terms with the meaning of this rejection, like Bao Yu is attempting to do, his double has, in a sense, given up and simply accepted them. There is a certain irony to the names of these two characters. Of course, they're both named Bao Yu, but our Bao Yu is Jia Bao Yu, while his double is named Zen Bao Yu. As I mentioned in part one, Jia is a homophone for false, while Zen is a homophone for true. Zen Bao Yu is the type of value we are more likely to come across in real life, as in our actual daily lives when we're not reading books. He is more attuned to what society in general considers true, whereas Jia Bao Yu, our Bao Yu, recognize these principles as false or misleading. We see during this conversation that whatever maturity Bao Yu is going to attain by the end of the novel, it is not going to adhere to whatever common notions we may have of the word. Bao Yu is as vehemently opposed to this sort of maturity now as he was when he was a child. He's looking for some other way, some other sense of meaning. He attains this when his jade of spiritual understanding is finally returned to him. A monk mysteriously appears at the mansion, declaring that he will return the jade in exchange for a large sum of money. At the time, Bao Yu is once again bedridden, still not quite recovered from the mental and physical illness that has been tormenting him since the jade was first lost. Upon the jade being returned, Bao Yu falls into his final dream. In it, he is once more transported to the illusory land of Great Void, now known as the Happy Land of Truth. This name change is joined by a new couplet. When false gives way to true, true surpasses false. Though nothingness exists, being differs from nothingness. Now, it seems that what was once false is now true, and that the illusory land is now the land of truth. The dream world, which seemed false at first, has now been revealed as the true world. Here, Bao Yu runs into many of the women who have passed away throughout the story, 
Yuan Yang, Dai Yu, and even Qin Ke Ching. However, none of them recognize him. They look like the people he knew, but they're somehow different. Once again, he comes across the register of the Twelve Beauties, and begins to read. Now, he is able to recognize that all these premonitions were tied to women from his family, and all of them have either come true or are in the midst of coming true. This is the meaning of the illusory land becoming the land of truth. It only seemed illusory because Bao Yu was so attached to the material world. Now that his attachments are being severed, he is able to understand this heavenly realm as the truth. As the monk says at the end of the dream, all earthly ties of affection are bewitchments. Bao Yu at this point recognizes that what he was after all this time wasn't girls, but what the girls represent. He sees that the women of his family, who he knew on earth as individuals, were but manifestations of something more eternal. This is why the women in heaven look like the girls he knew, but don't have any of the individual emotions or attachments that they had on earth. Thus, they don't recognize Bao Yu, being still in his mortal state. Each represent a certain form of love and beauty. But this love and beauty can only properly reside in heaven. As we've seen, on earth, it is either destroyed or corrupted. After this dream, Bao Yu loses his attachment to girls. We witness a conversation in which a newer maid laments the fact that she had deliberately tried to enter Bao Yu's service after hearing how nice and generous he was to his maids, only to find that he won't even look at her anymore. In fact, he's stopped joking around with Shi Zhen and all the others as well. The monk returns, and Bao Yu and him have a conversation, which we only witness through snippets relayed by a page to Lady Wang. These snippets include the phrases Blue Ridge Peak and Land of Great Void. From this, we can tell that the monk has revealed to Bao Yu the origin of the Jade of Spiritual Understanding, and the nature of this story itself. At this point, Bao Yu understands precisely the nature of the relationship between the material and the divine world. This is, in essence, the goal of all attempts at religious understanding. Thus, we could say that after this conversation, Bao Yu has, in a certain sense, reached enlightenment. It's interesting and important that Bao Yu's story doesn't end here. It would make a certain amount of sense for Bao Yu to simply renounce the world at this exact moment. If this were the case, then our takeaway from Bao Yu's story would be simply that this world is false and that the other world is true. This would, of course, negate much of the impact of the novel. We have to remember that Bao Yu, while the main character, is but one of many characters. Such an ending would encourage a sort of solipsism that prevents any real understanding. Instead, Bao Yu sticks around, and it is what happens after he sticks around that I think sheds the most light on this novel's philosophical outlook. When we next see Bao Yu, he is sitting in his study reading the Chang Tzu, which is a foundational Taoist text. Specifically, he is reading the chapter Autumn Floods. In this chapter, the spiritual guardian of the He River travels to the North Sea and realizes that the river he prides himself on so much is nothing compared to the grandness of the ocean. The Lord of the Northern Sea tells him, quote, A frog in a well cannot be talked with about the sea. He is confined to the limits of his hole. An insect of the summer cannot be talked with about ice. It knows nothing beyond its own season. However, the Lord of the North Sea then tells the guardian of the He River that despite the immensity of the sea which he lords over, 
he doesn't think too highly of himself, because he recognizes that compared to the heaven and earth, the sea is as minuscule as the Ha River when compared to the North Sea. He goes on to say that scale doesn't mean anything, that the smallest and the greatest things are not of lesser or greater importance, but all have their own qualities that can't be compared. The point here is that one shouldn't dwell too much on matters of perspective, on what appears more or less important, but should equally value all things. One should not overly pride oneself on what one has or does, nor should one overly denigrate others for what they have or do. He says, quote, While a great man does not strive after property and wealth, he does not plume himself on declining them. While he does not borrow the help of others to accomplish his affairs, he does not plume himself on supporting himself by his own strength nor does he despise those who in their greed do what is mean. He ends by saying, quote, Following and honoring heaven and taking no account of earth is like following and honoring the yin and taking no account of the yang. I dwell on this so extensively because these sentiments are vital to understanding what Bao Yu chooses to do next. His wife, Bao Chai, comes in and finds him reading the book. Bao Chai, who represents the worldly, tries to convince Bao Yu that true wisdom is to be found in participating in the government and helping the people, rather than renouncing the world and becoming a hermit. She argues that hermits are those who run away from despotic or declining governments, but that in Bao Yu's time, quote, we live under a sage emperor. Our family is deeply indebted to the state. She then says, quote, Since your childhood, you've been treasured by the old lady while she was alive, and by your parents. My advice to you is to take a grip on yourself and study hard, because if you can pass the examination, even if you stop at that, you'll be paying back your debt of gratitude for your sovereign's favor and your ancestors' virtue. Bao Chai's argument here is based on Confucian values, filial piety, and a respect for benevolent authority, both of which carry with them certain responsibilities towards one's elders and superiors. And there's really no sense here in which Bao Chai is incorrect. It is good to try to use one's learning to help others, especially when one has been helped so much themselves. The emphasis here is on good government and a good upbringing. If Bao Yu lived in despotic times or in a disrespectful family, his responsibilities might differ. Interestingly, Bao Yu actually listens to Bao Chai here and agrees with what she said, particularly the part about repaying his debts to his family. And so Bao Yu begins to study in earnest for the examination even going so far as to burn whole his books about Taoism and Zen Buddhism. However, Bao Chai overhears him chanting as they burn, Buddha's nature is not to be found in sacred canons. The fairy bark sails beyond the realm of alchemy. On the day of the examination, when taking leave of his family, Bao Yu kowtows to his mother and says, quote, I can never repay the mother who gave birth to me, but I shall do as well as I can in the examination to obtain a good degree and to make you happy. Then I shall have done my duty as a son and atoned for all my faults. We can see that Bao Yu has not had a total change of heart. He is not undertaking the examination in the hopes of achieving a government position and supporting his family because he has not made the simple turnaround that Zen Bao Yu, his double, made in suddenly coming to revere such worldly things. What he is doing instead is preparing himself for his final renunciation by tying up his loose ends here on earth. He is not following heaven and taking no account of the earth. Instead, he has recognized that both heaven and earth 
have their own qualities, that neither is necessarily better or more important than the other, that if heaven was enough in itself, there'd be no reason for earth at all. The reason we are brought down here is to attain virtue, by learning how to achieve goodness even in the face of suffering and evil. In the novel's frame story, the priest speaks of the vermilion pearl plant, aka Daiyu, repaying her debt of gratitude to Shen Ying, aka Bao Yu, by shedding as many tears as she can in a lifetime. Clearly, this idea of repaying kindness in some manner is part of heavenly virtue. Bao Yu has been raised and doted on by his family. His erratic behavior has been accepted and tolerated, for the most part. He has been given love unconditionally, and even when they were acting against his wishes, his family was acting in accord with what they thought were his best interests. Therefore, Bao Yu recognizes that he needs to do something in return, to put their interests first for once, and he does so by undertaking this mostly symbolic act of going through and passing the examinations, even knowing that he has no intention of using this new status for anything. After he passes the examination with honors, and is even recognized by the emperor himself, Bao Yu disappears. We last see him, accompanied by the Taoist priest and Buddhist monk from the novel's beginning, appearing before his father, who is returning home from burying the Lady Dowager, as well as Daiyu, in their ancestral graveyard, down south. At first, his father doesn't recognize him with his shaved head and bare feet, but as Bao Yu kowtows to him, his father finally understands what is going on. Before the two can share any words, the priest and monk tell Bao Yu that he has fulfilled his worldly obligations and that they may now depart. Unlike Shi Chen, who is repulsed by her family's sins, Bao Yu does not choose to renounce the world out of anger. In fact, his final acts are indicative of the love he still feels for his family, a love not based on mere attachment or fear, but a love that is willing to let go. If we remember Prince Andre from War and Peace, we might find an equivalent sort of love, a love that is outside of or beyond this world, the love of a man who can somehow see beyond our world, who can see what we truly are, and recognizes that the time will soon come when he is no longer a part of it. In the end, Bao Yu has fulfilled the will of both heaven and earth, and in this way proven that our attempt to distinguish which is true and which is false has all been folly. They are both equally true, but true in different ways. Cao Shui Qin uses this binary distinction of truth or falsehood to show the inadequacy of separating such poles. In our logic, Something cannot possibly be true and false at the same time. However, the teachings of Taoism, with the symbol of the yin and yang, show that such a binary is truly impossible. Through paradox, misdirection, and irony, Shui Qin attempts to show us that the true and the false are part of one another. This book is not cruel for cruelty's sake, and it does not delight in exposing the evils of the world. Cao Shui Qin is not Thomas Hardy. This isn't Jude the Obscure, where the immorality of the world is meant to batter us down page after page. Yes, this is a book about suffering, and it's a book about being born into a world that differs greatly from our ideals, a world of heartbreak and of anguish. It is a world where both the evil and the good are punished, where even the protection of the powerful is not enough. The Jia family has the favor of the emperor, 
They have wealth and status, access to the greatest knowledge and the most exciting entertainment, but even they cannot escape suffering. However, Dream of the Red Chamber offers us a light, and it does so through the means of religion and through metaphysics. It does so by accepting that this suffering is but one part, and that to focus on it exclusively is to become imbalanced, and to ignore much of human existence. The innocent frivolity of the novel's first volume is not erased by the tragedies of the final volume. The novel as a form is atemporal. We, as the reader, can always return to that time. It will always be a part of our world. That is the heavenly, the divine, the eternal good. The poetry meetings that the young Jia women hold in the first half of the book are more than fun parties. They are an opportunity for the children of the garden to reach higher, to participate in something beyond themselves. The style of poetry they write is heavily indebted to the past. The structures, the rhymes, and even the images are pulled straight from earlier canonical works. This is in part, a hearkening for the past, an idea that that which is ancient is somehow better or more pure. However, within this is an acknowledgement that these traditions need never die, that the world the Jia family inhabits is that same world that the ancient poets lived in. Bao Chai and Dai Yu, two teenage girls, can write poetry in which they communicate directly with poets from hundreds of years prior. This connection through time jumps over all the events and misfortunes of all those people who lived all their lives in between. Thus, the garden never dies. It passes away in one place at one time, and reappears in another place during another time. The girls themselves, their intelligence, their artistry, and their innocence also never passes. These girls are earthly representations of eternal spirits. They are emanations of all that we value, such as love and beauty, but also that which comes along with love and beauty, such as yearning and loss. We cannot make the mistake of considering only evil to be necessary or eternal and not the good. Although the events of the book primarily run in a negative direction, with things turning from good to bad to worse, we must remember that the good does not simply disappear when it leaves a certain time or a certain place. It always returns. That's the nature of the illusory land of great void, aka the holy land of truth. It is the eternal place where the good resides, from where it can enter our world at any time and in any place. Thus, it can't be destroyed, and in fact, it might even outlive our topsy-turvy material world. The nature of heaven and hell in Dream of the Red Chamber is not necessarily the same as our popular idea. After Dai Yu's death, Bao Yu slips into a dream, where he meets a spirit on its way to hell. He's looking for Daiyu, trying to find some way to be with her again. He is still constrained by his attachments to the material world in the form of individuals. The spirit tells Baoyu that Daiyu is gone, that after death human souls cease to have form, and thus can't be found like they can be on earth. Baoyu asks the spirit how, if this is the case, Hell can exist. The spirit tells him that it doesn't, really. It is a dream cooked up by people to scare each other into being good. Hell only exists for those who believe in it. He says that the only way for Baoyu to see Daiyu again is to cultivate virtue and reach heaven. Now, Baoyu doesn't question this assertion at the time, because the spirit follows the statement up by throwing a rock at his face, but it's clear that the same argument made here against hell could also easily apply to heaven. If spirits dissipate after death and have no form, how can Baoyu and Daiyu possibly meet again, even in heaven? 
Later in the story, Bao Yu has another dream in which he returns to the illusory land of Great Void, now known as the Happy Land of Truth. He runs into many characters he knows, but they all insist that they'd never met him, and that the names he knows them by are not their true names. What this reveals to us is that Qin Ke Ching, along with all of the other girls in the mansion, are embodiments of some spirit, and that they represent some form or some aspect of love and suffering. The twelve beauties of Qin Ling that Bao Yu reads about in the register are their archetypes. On earth, they take the form of individuals with individual characteristics, but in heaven, they are simply ideas. This has much in common with Western conceptions of eternal ideas, such as Plato's, where each object on earth, such as a flower, is but an imperfect representation of some ideal of flowerness, for example, that exists in some immaterial realm. The point of these sorts of metaphysical conceptions is to develop an understanding of the abstract and the way it relates to the particular. In Dream of the Red Chamber specifically, its metaphysics is key to understanding whether the book is fundamentally optimistic or pessimistic in its depiction of human suffering. If the story was only its material elements, i.e. the sufferings of the Jia family and those around them, then the outlook would be almost unrelentingly pessimistic. It would be a story of childlike innocence being crushed by the so-called real world. However, our brief glimpses into the heavenly realm offer us an alternative way of looking at reality, a way that elevates us above the material. Love and beauty are eternal, cruelty, greed, and torment are worldly, and therefore impermanent. This is crucially important for our reading of the novel. Without this aspect, it would be easy to be overwhelmed by the tribulations and suffering within. We must remember the love and joy, the friendship between Granny Liu and the Lady Dowager, between Bao Chai and Dai Yu, the loyalty of Yuan Yang, the carefree generosity of Bao Yu, the poetry meetings where the family bond over expressions of beauty, among much, much more. These are in no way negated by disappearing with time, with their individual manifestations passing away. We must remember that, in a way, these moments last forever. In the book, they last forever in heaven, but you don't have to believe this heaven literally exists to recognize what the book is trying to tell us, which is that nothing can destroy love and beauty, not even the confusion and chaos of our world, not even hatred and cruelty and pure random misfortune. Love and beauty are always present in some sense, always ready to be reborn into the world. And knowing this, we can face with new strength whatever suffering and confusion may await us in this topsy-turvy world. All good things in this world must end, and to make an end is good, for there is nothing good which does not end, and this series is no exception. I have attempted, over the course of these three shows, to explain, as far as my ability allows, Dream of the Red Chamber by Cao Shui Qin. There is much that I don't understand about the book. And there is much that I had to ignore in order to keep this series at least somewhat focused. But what I hope to have done is to either introduce the book to you if you didn't know about it before, or if you have read it, to offer some new ways of thinking about it, or some new connections you may have overlooked. While rereading the book and working on this series, I developed an appreciation for this novel that dwarves even the high, high, high estimation I had of it after my first reading. I understand the reasons why this book might often be overlooked by Western audiences. There is the issue of translation, which is more significant when it comes to languages as disparate as Chinese and European languages. There is the issue of cultural understanding. 
there are relationships and beliefs in this novel that won't immediately make sense to someone unfamiliar with Chinese culture. However, this latter issue is also an opportunity to learn. If you make an effort to understand the characters as people, the other elements will fall into place eventually. Another issue may be length, but I would never hold that against any book. In fact, usually the longer the better. This book, like all works of literature that we like to call great or classic, delves into human life in a way that is equally personal and universal. It introduces us to characters that we love because they are unique, and yet understand because they are just like us. Their way of life may be foreign and strange, and their relationships determined by traditions that are unfamiliar, but at the same time we can recognize what they're feeling. We've been in love, we've been hurt, we've lost people and we've suffered, we've laughed with our friends and we've told each other stupid jokes or had stupid misunderstandings, we've been afraid and we've been comforted. What this book offers is a way of conceptualizing these myriad emotions, a philosophy that allows us to reconcile ourselves to the changing tides of joy and suffering, love and hate, beauty and ugliness, truth and falsehood. It doesn't offer us a simple answer or a simple explanation, but instead merely offers a hint and leaves us to come to our own conclusions. As the Taoist immortal Reverend Void says in the final page of the novel, So it's all hot air. Fantastic. Neither author, transcriber, nor readers can tell what it is about. It is nothing but a literary diversion to entertain readers. I'd like to thank everybody who listened to this series of shows uh, I hope you enjoyed them. I greatly enjoyed making this. I just love this book so much. It's really a beautiful thing. Uh, you can subscribe to this show, this podcast, on Spotify or Apple or Podcatcher, any of these sort of places. It's everywhere. It should be everywhere. Uh, and it's also uploaded on YouTube. If you like the show, please share it with your friends or people you think might enjoy the show. That's really the the only way it's going to get out there to people, I think. I think I've done a good job with this one. I really think the, the this, this one came together quite well. I'm, I'm quite proud. Uh, you can visit my website, balkwell.substack.com where all the episodes are uploaded, and I also um, publish essays every two weeks about a variety of topics. You can subscribe to the website as a newsletter and receive emails whenever I put something new out, if you're interested. And next month, we will be covering Frankenstein, the Modern Prometheus, by Mary Shelley unsure at the moment whether it will be a two-parter or just a single episode it will really have to we'll just have to see it, it was originally going to be a mini episode and i just had way too much i wanted to talk about so it's possible it'll run into two parts so hope you enjoy that it's a much shorter book so if you'd like to read it in preparation it's you certainly have time to do that um Quite a good one. I like that one quite a great deal. So look forward to that. Goodbye. <laughs> 有用不是了